Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Welcome here. Welcome to our Christmas service this morning. We are a little bit different than most churches in that we don't own a building. We rent this space, and this building is closed from the 24th to the 27th, so we don't have access to this space on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day when most uh, traditional Christmas services take place, hence our Christmas service on the 22nd. So I'm so glad that you've come to celebrate the birth of our Savior and our King with us this morning. You're going to notice that the children are going to be with us during the service today. We've given the hardworking volunteers who teach and take care of the children on a regular basis. Uh, We've given them a well-deserved break over these holidays here. So you might hear some extra crying or noise or commotion throughout the service this morning. That's totally okay. We love children here at Grace Fellowship. Also, if you are a parent who feels that your child is getting cranky and you want something to do with them, we do have a little room off to the back there, right over the exit sign there. I think that's, it's so dark, but I think that's Jessica waving there. Um, (laughs) So we do have a room there with some toys in there if you want to go play with your kid and and let them roam free for a little bit. That's totally fine with us. I've also made a conscious effort this morning to be shorter with my sermon than I typically am just to help you parents out. So throughout the month of December, we have been going through a series called Anticipating the Messiah, which refers to these Old Testament prophecies that were written before Jesus ever came to earth about the coming Jesus. And we have seen this anticipation from the Jewish people for their coming rescuer, their Messiah and Savior that they were anticipating. And we've also um, seen throughout this series that the Jewish people didn't realize that this Messiah was coming for the whole world, not just them, which makes this season of celebration so much more meaningful to us who are not Jews, as Jesus came not just to save the Jewish people of the Old Testament, but he came to earth to save for himself a people of all nations, all tribes, throughout all of time, which thankfully includes us. So this morning, again, we're going to be going through a prophecy about the coming baby Jesus, one that we find in the Old Testament. Again, if you happen to have a Bible with you, you will notice that it's divided into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament was written prior to the birth of Jesus Christ, and the New Testament is Really, it starts with the story of the birth of Jesus, and it continues on with uh, the ministry of Jesus and the very early church and the stories about the apostles of Jesus. And it's, it's interesting that the very thing that we are celebrating this morning it what, is what makes this major division between the Old and New Testament in the Bible, the coming Jesus. And so the Old Testament prophecy that foretells of the coming Jesus that we're going to look at through today is in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. So if you have a paper version of the Bible, I think if you flop it open, you'll probably find it near the middle of the book. Um, If you have a Bible app and you're struggling to find the book of Isaiah, you can just use a search function. It should pop up. I think you're going to find it hugely beneficial uh, to be able to follow along as I go through it this morning. So Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The verses are going to play out on the screen behind me, and then we'll dig into this text together. Reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Heavenly Father, as Christmas Day is fast approaching, I pray that you help us to see throughout this season, that the only reason we have anything to celebrate is because you sent your Son to save humanity from Satan, 
sin and death. And this is worthy of celebration. This is worthy of a party. And this is why we can have such joy during the Christmas season. I pray that you would remove all of the things that we worship in your place during this season and during the rest of the year. All of the celebrations and the gifts and the time and the money can become things that we celebrate during Christmas rather than celebrating you with these things. So please turn our hearts to you this morning as we go through this Old Testament passage that foretold of the birth of your son. Help us to see your greatness, your faithfulness, your goodness, and your power through this passage of Scripture this morning. And help us to worship you for all of those things. Amen. So again, as it so often is, as we read the Bible, especially when we read in the Old Testament, and we read prophecies about events that are about to take place uh, maybe a long time after the time of the writings, these passages of Scripture seem awfully confusing and make no sense to us. And I think you're going to see that it's, it's helpful to know what is going on in this passage if you know, or it's helpful to know the context. It's going to help you to know what's going on in this passage. So during, um, we want to know during the time of this writing, who, who was writing it, what was going on, who was it written to. And so I'm just going to give you a very brief context this morning so everything doesn't seem so maybe muddled and confusing. However, if you want more background on this whole prophecy, I would encourage you to go to graceass.com, the website, and watch uh, the sermon from two weeks ago where we went through Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. It gives a fairly detailed background on this story. But for today, what we need to know about this prophecy about Jesus is that it takes place hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And the, the Old Testament Jewish people who were God's chosen people during uh, the Old Testament period, they had this big fight and they had split into two nations. And the one nation called itself Judah, that was the southern portion, and it retained the capital city of Jerusalem. And the king during the time of this writing was King Ahaz. He was a wicked king who hated God. He didn't follow the uh, Old Covenant or the Old Testament law that God had laid out for his Old Testament people, the Jewish people. And so the prophet Isaiah had been warning the nation and the king that bad things are going to happen. The nation's going to be destroyed as judgment for their disobedience, and they need to turn back to God. And Isaiah, he's been pleading with King Ahaz and and the people to turn from their wicked ways, or judgment's going to fall upon the whole nation, and the country's going to be destroyed, and it's going to be destroyed by the Assyrian nation, a nation they think they are in an alliance with. But within these messages of judgment and coming destruction, there were messages of hope that this judgment wouldn't be the end. Help is coming, and God would ultimately, in the end, save his people despite their blatant disobedience. And this is the message that we see in our passage today. So keep in mind, as we go through this, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah to a very wicked king Ahaz and the nation of Judah, and he is speaking of a future time of judgment. But today's portion of scripture is a message of future hope even in the message of future judgment. So what does Isaiah say in verse 2 of chapter 9? Here we go. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. So he's giving this message of judgment to King Ahaz and the people. This nugget, uh, or in giving this message to these people, this nugget of hope comes out. As God reveals this future invasion of Assyria and the destruction of of Jerusalem to the king through Isaiah, we can see that hope is included in the message. Assyria will invade, the country will be destroyed because of their great disobedience, because of their great sin, but through it all, the people who have seen this great darkness, this invasion, this destruction, this war in their lifetime, those people will see a great light. And we can see from verse 1 that he's specifically speaking of a certain region in Judah called Galilee. This was the northern region of Judah that would see the greatest immediate judgment in the land of Judah. The northern part of Judah is the place that the Assyrians would come and invade first, and it would suffer the most devastating damage of this invasion. And to make things worse, this is the area of Judah that was known for being poor. It was known 
as the place that you did not want to be from. In fact, hundreds of years earlier, during the height of the prosperity of Jerusalem and Israel, King Solomon had purchased a bunch of huge cedar trees and gold from his friend, King of Tyre, to build this amazing temple in Jerusalem. And he paid for all this stuff, this gold and these cedar, these big cedar trees. He paid for it with 20 cities in the region of Galilee, which the king of Tyre agreed to sight unseen. Now, when King Hiram, king of Tyre, eventually comes out to look at these cities in Galilee, which, he had, been, which had been given to him for all this cedar and gold, he says, what kind of cities are these that you have given me, my brother? In 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 13. In other words, these cities in Galilee are garbage. Nevertheless, he took them as payment. And from that point on, many people who were not of Jewish descent started to settle in that region because King of Tyre now owned them. Many Gentiles or non-Jews mixed with the Jewish people. And at this point in history, it became a place that nobody wanted to be from. You could say it was sort of like Manitoba today. It's the place, place where the Jews are ashamed to be from, a place where the Gentiles are ashamed to be from. Jews were ashamed that their pure Jewish bloodline had been tainted by the non-Jewish people. And the non-Jews were ashamed that they had to, to live among these Jews. It was a poverty-stricken place, a shameful place, a depressing place. And so this place stood out uh, as a place of scorn for hundreds of years and, and continued to be so, especially for the Jewish people up until our text today, when Isaiah says that this region of darkness, this region of scorn, this place that is known for being the worst of the worst, this dark place of Galilee was about to be destroyed, but there's hope this place of all places will see a great light. Despite the dark past of Galilee and despite the utter destruction that Galilee would experience in the near future, just a few years after Isaiah's prophecy here, and despite the poverty and the disease and the crime in this region, a great light will come. And this is the exciting news. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. This light that will come into and out of this dark region will make the nation grow. The light will bring people into its kingdom. With, and with these new people, there will be rejoicing because of this kingdom growth. There will be feasting like the way we feast after harvest at Thanksgiving. Food and drink and feasting and partying because of this great light that will come out of this dark place. Verse 4 tells us that in all this perceived hopelessness, all the oppression and darkness and destruction, the light will come. And this light will bring with it relief from the oppression, relief from being downtrodden. In verse 5, for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. All their fighting and their striving will come to an end and every soldier's boot and blood-soaked clothing will be burned as fuel for the fire because they're not going to need it anymore. The oppression will be over. The darkness will be overcome by the light and there will be permanent victory for these people who dwell in darkness. They can burn the weapons and the armor for war because they don't need it. Eternal peace. This light will come out of the darkness. It will overcome the darkness and it will, it will put a permanent end to this darkness. And it will bring permanent, everlasting joy and peace. So what or who will this light be that Isaiah speaks of? Who could be this light that erases the darkness of the past and the upcoming uncertainty of future destruction? Let's read verses 6 and 7, where we find more of the answer. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his govern government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
This light that comes out of the darkness will be a baby boy, a son, and he will establish his kingdom out of the darkness, and he will be the head of this kingdom. He will cause the kingdom to increase. He will be born of a woman from the line of King David, fully man, yet fully God. Verse 6 says, mighty God. And his kingdom will have no end. He will bring his people into his kingdom. He will cause his kingdom to grow. He will establish his kingdom. And it's going to go on forevermore. It's not like the kingdoms of the past. It's not like Judah in this passage where it would be destroyed and come to an end. This baby boy would grow up to establish a kingdom forever. Out of the darkness, he would establish a kingdom where there is no darkness, where there is no war, where there is feasting and joy and celebration Out of the darkness comes the light. Out of the darkness comes a kingdom that lasts forever. Out of the darkness, feasting and victory and partying. Out of the poor and depressed and downtrodden, a kingdom of light and prosperity. This boy, born of the woman from the line of David, would be Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate this Christmas. He was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Nazareth of Galilee, the dark and oppressed place spoken of here by Isaiah hundreds of years before Jesus ever came to earth. And out of Galilee, he started his ministry. Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father, comes down to earth as a baby born in a barn, grew up in the ghetto to save the world from sin. This is the great light. You see, in our text today, Isaiah was specifically speaking to Judah and King Ahaz. And he tells them that out of this dark place of Galilee, a light will come and save the nation, save the people, and prosper them. But this prophecy wasn't just about Galilee. Even though those specific details happened, Jesus from Galilee was a great light to the people of Galilee, There is so much more to that prophecy, though. There is the specific fulfilled prophecy by the event of the birth of Jesus, but the prophecy is bigger than just the lowly place of Galilee. Looking at the world today, we know that Galilee isn't the only dark place in the world. We know that Jesus didn't come just to shine a light to those impure, disobedient people only from Galilee. Jesus did not come just to save Galilee and the nation of Judah. No, darkness is all around us today. Jesus left the riches of his kingdom and entered the darkness of this world to save the world. You see, this world is like the Galilee of God's kingdom. So we are just like Galilee. We all deserve punishment for sin. We all deserve to die. We're all impure. We all deserve judgment and destruction. There's nothing special about us. There's only shame and disappointment that we carry for our failure to live up to God's standards. We're all impure. We're all tainted people, just like the people from Galilee. You see, just as the Old Testament Jews had been disobedient to what God had called them to do, bringing such darkness upon the region of Judah and Galilee, we too have been disobedient to what God has called us to do, bringing the darkness of sin and guilt into this region of God's kingdom, the world. And so we as humanity have brought the need for judgment and punishment down upon ourselves, much like the region of Galilee. If you had lived in the region of Galilee at the time of Isaiah, you knew that you were not good enough. You knew that God had commanded you not to intermarry with all the evil nations that surrounded you, but you did it anyway. You knew that God had called you to follow his Old Testament law, but you didn't because you adopted the religions and the traditions and the gods of the people with whom you now shared the land. We've all done the same, worshiping the gods of this world while denying the one true God. But it was out of these lowly, disobedient Galilean people that Jesus would come. And it was from these people that he would save many. And in the bigger picture, it was out of the sin of humanity in which we have all taken part. That Jesus came to this dark world to bring a pure and holy gift. To give us eternal life and riches in his kingdom. 
to bring the light. When Jesus came to earth, he brought with him the payment for the sin of his people. No longer were you saved by keeping the Old Testament law. No longer were you a part of God's chosen people by being a pure Jew. No, Jesus came to save for himself a nation of people from all tribes, all tongues, all nations, just like those intermarried and impure people from Galilee. When Jesus came, all you had to do was believe that he came to pay for your guilt and sin. And just like the Galileans, if you're alive and breathing today, you know that you're not good enough. You have sinned, meaning you have done things God has commanded you not to do. Or you have not performed the things that he has required you to do. You know you're not good enough to stand in front of God one day and defend your actions. You will be found guilty and you will be condemned to death because of those sins when you meet him face to face one day. We all come from this dark place of earth. We all must know that we're not worthy to be a part of this new kingdom that Jesus brought with him when he was born to this earth. We're all under the oppression of sin and Satan, and we know there is nothing that we can do about it. The whole world is a dark place. Every person has a dark heart. Every person, when given freedom, would rather sin selfishly than obey God. Humanity is dark. Humanity seems as though it has no hope. You see, it wasn't only out of the darkness of Galilee that Jesus came into the world. It was out of our own darkness. The darkness of us. That Jesus emerged as a savior to a diverse, mixed group of people who understand that they're not good enough, just like those from Galilee. A sinful, diverse group of people who know that we deserve Nothing good, you and I. Jesus was from heaven, but also from this world to save the people from this world. John 3.16, probably one of the most famous verses in all of the Bible, describe the mission of God the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus came to save for himself a people from the whole earth to create this everlasting kingdom of which we have the privilege of being a part of. If we only too will realize that we're a sinful people from earth of all places, so inferior to heaven, earth such a, such a tainted place, a wicked place, such an unworthy place, we don't deserve it a seat at the table of God's kingdom. We're not good enough. We're not worthy. We're all corrupted by sin. But God is so good, so good that he sent his son who was born into the darkness and sin of this world. And he was such a pure light that he was able to live his entire life without sin. He was pure and righteous. He then died on the cross to pay what we owe for our sin, our death. Then he rose again, defeating death and Satan so that we can have victory over death. When we believe in Jesus, when physical death comes for us, if we believe in Jesus, he ushers us into eternal life in his kingdom forever. And he brings light to this dark place, making it his, bringing his kingdom to us. We don't have to die. Out of the darkness of death and rottenness of this world, we get eternal life, riches beyond compare, and a seat at the table of the king whose kingdom never ends. It never goes to war. There's always peace. And all because Jesus came to this dark place and brought with him the light and life to give to his people. Out of darkness, light. God himself here with us on earth. This is the reason that I celebrate Christmas. I'm a sinner from earth. I don't deserve anything good. I don't deserve riches in the kingdom of Jesus. I don't deserve eternal life. I don't deserve anything good. Yet Jesus came to this dark earth, paid for my sin, and gave me life eternal. I'm going to celebrate that this Christmas. You see, the Old Testament Jews, they were looking forward to this. They anticipated their Messiah coming. They didn't know when or how. They only had these cryptic prophecies 
that we've been going through this past month. Today, however, we have the New Testament. We have the benefit of looking back to the event that was prophesied. We can see it fulfilled out of the darkness. There shone a great light, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, King of kings, the one who died and rose on my behalf so I could live with him forevermore. Is there anything better than that to celebrate this Christmas? I don't think so. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he did not just stay a little baby, but he grew into a man who fulfilled the mission that you sent him on, to pay for the sin of mankind and to rescue a people for yourself, to build your kingdom. I thank you that we get to be a part of that kingdom, Jesus. If we only repent of our sin and believe that you have taken care of our sin, thank you for seeing us as pure, even though we're not, and you give us hope and light in this world that is a dark place. Thank you that you brought the light. Amen.